Beloved congregation, I direct your attention to John chapter 4 again, and I'd like to read John 4, verse 34. This is page 1642. John 4, verse 34. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Beloved, today we have enjoyed the Lord's Supper, and that's a great blessing. But the question that comes to us now in the post-communion service is this. Why does the Lord feed us? And the answer is that he feeds us not to fatten us and make us spiritually lazy, but the opposite. He feeds us so that we might be strengthened and made spiritually healthy. And so what does spiritual health look like? How does the spirit actually do this? Accomplishing spiritual health. Well, the spirit causes us, calls us to receive Christ, to rest in Christ, to rejoice in Christ. That's been the father's point. Behold the lamb for this purpose, so that more and more we might resemble Christ. That's the Spirit's goal with the Supper. And with that in mind, we come to the text here saying, the Spirit has called his people, invited his people, allowed his people, brought his people to receive Christ, rest in Christ, rejoice in Christ, so that they might start to resemble Christ, and in particular, resemble Christ's priorities. And here's what we will see as we work through this sermon then. The Spirit uses the Lord's Supper to make us hunger more for the Lord's food. A little bit of mystery there that will become clear, hopefully, in the sermon. The Spirit uses the Lord's Supper to make us hunger more for the Lord's food. And so our title is simply that, The Lord's Food, and We'll have two points and more of a concluding application at the end. So two points in a concluding application. Our title is The Lord's Food. And first of all, we're looking at the priority. And here we're talking about the son's priority, Jesus's priority. Now, children, you've probably heard of the Lord's Supper. I mean, it's something we say. It's something we celebrate here. So you've heard that language before, Lord's Supper. And then you think of the table, maybe the bread, the wine, but now my title is The Lord's Food. And that might be a bit confusing. Uh, did Pastor Mark just see saying the Lord's Supper in a kind of a funny way? The Lord's Food? What, what's he talking about? Well, what is the Lord's Food? It's an interesting question. What does Jesus love to eat? He actually tells us that in verse 34. And this is his word picture. Verse 34, Jesus said to them, my food, so here's the Lord's food. He's about to tell us, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Now that's really strange. My food, what I hunger for most What satisfies me most, Jesus says, more than any other meal is to do the Father's will and work. Do you see that? Now here Jesus is obviously using imagery to teach us about his most basic priorities. And we've said the Holy Spirit uses the supper 
to more and more make us hunger after the Lord's food. So that, in other words, Christ's priorities become the Christian's priorities. And so as I read verse 34, yes, I'm saying this is Jesus's priorities. My food is to do the Father's will and to accomplish his work. And as the Christian, I'm saying, Holy Spirit, I want to have his priorities too. Make that more for me. Okay, that's the aim of this sermon. Now, Jesus is using imagery here to teach us about his most basic priority, and it seems to be coming from Deuteronomy 8. You don't need to turn there, but just, just listen to these words. They're familiar to you, I think. Deuteronomy 8, so Moses is on the edge of the land of Canaan with the Israelites, and Deuteronomy, the whole book of Deuteronomy, is really a sermon that Moses is preaching to the people, reapplying the instruction and the law to them. And Deuteronomy 8, verse 2 says this, And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and to test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you. He allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now, Jesus loved that text. In fact, you might know that he quoted that text to Satan. Another time when Jesus is in the wilderness... Being tempted by the devil, Matthew 4, Satan is trying to derail Christ from accomplishing his mission. Satan's there to say, let me just give you all the glory now. Bow down before me, and um, I will give you glory. Just turn these stones into bread. You will be filled. And Jesus knows the subtlety of Satan. He knows what Satan's after. Satan's trying to keep me from completing the Father's work namely saving my people, becoming the Lamb of God to die for them. And so Jesus quotes this text. Oh, Satan, man does not live by bread alone. Yes, I've been hungry for 40 days fasting in the wilderness, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so Jesus loved this text. He pulled it out as a dagger to ward off Satan. But he also is alluding to it here in our verse to teach his disciples about his priorities. Again, to teach them about his fixed focus on accomplishing the Father's will and work for him. Now, what's the context? Uh, well, the disciples, they have come back to Jesus carrying lunch, bread, bread. It's hot. It's the Middle East. I mean, you get in your van today, it's hot. Go to the Middle East, it's hot. Noon, uh, six o'clock, uh, says the sixth hour, that's noon, it's lunch hour. Uh, the sun is blazing. Jesus is tired, he hasn't eaten anything. And yet, when they return with food now, Jesus gives this surprising response. He says, I'm full. I'm satisfied. And, and they're confused, thinking, uh, did someone beat us with the lunch delivery? You see that, verse 33? Did, does he have some other stash of food that we don't know about? And he says, yes, I do have another stash of food. Verse 34, my food is to do the will of the Father, to accomplish his work. And so isn't that beautiful? Here we're looking into the heart of the Savior, his most basic priorities. And he's saying, I have hunger pangs for doing the Father's will. We get weak and lightheaded when we don't eat. And physically, Christ is just as human as you and I are. And that's his expo experience at the moment. He's weary. You read that earlier in the chapter. He needs food. And yet... In this moment, he's saying, I'm, I've been re-energized by feeding on a deeper, more significant substance than food itself. I'm feeding on doing the Father's will. 
And so that's Christ's priority. It's to obey the Father, to do his will. And dear Christian, this is one great purpose why the Spirit feeds us today. That more and more it would become our priority to do the Father's will revealed to us in his word. But then there's the other aspect of that, and that is to finish his work. And there Jesus is is talking about being faithful to his mission. And the context makes it very clear. What is the Father's work that Jesus is talking about? Well, it's the salvation of sinners. Because the disciples have gone off to the town to look for food, and in the meantime, the Father has brought Jesus a meal in the form of this woman. And isn't this glorious? Because this woman has been the object of many men's appetites. Five husbands and now living with a guy. And their appetite was to get her to use her in order to satisfy themselves. The father has brought her, as it were, as a meal to the son, not to use her but to redeem her, to give her life, to liberate her. And this is what Christ is so hungry for, to bring living waters to the spiritually thirsty. Maybe you know the story, but it's always good to see our Lord in action. And so think about it here again uh, with me. As we've said, it's hot. Jesus' disciples have been traveling with him north from Judea traveling through Samaria to Galilee. They have no food. And now the disciples realize it's lunchtime and they have to travel into a Samaritan village to go and get some. And they're probably frustrated as they do so. Like, who's planning this whole debacle? Don't we have a leader? I mean, we have to go into a Samaritan town to beg for food or to pay for it? The Jews didn't get along with Samaritans. But don't think their leader has had a planning lapse. Jesus is on mission. And he's here to meet someone. He's here to meet this woman at the well. And what a mission it is, what he seeks to do for her. He stops there because he's hungry to bring her life. Notice she comes here at noon. You see this early in the chapter. If you go back to verse 5 and 6, verse 6, it says it was the sixth hour. Verse 7, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. And the question that every commentator asks is why is she coming at noon? It's the hottest part of the day. You come in the morning or you come at night and you come in a group. And that's why she came at noon. She doesn't want to see anyone. Even by Samaritan standards, she was shameful. She was immoral. Are you kidding? Five husbands now living with a guy? Jesus is there to meet her. And he crosses all these antagonistic boundaries to reach her. This is how eager he is to bring living waters to her. He's a Jew. She's a Samaritan. She raises questions about it. Verse 9. How is it that you being a Jew ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? Come on, Jewish man. I know what you think about us Samaritans. I know that you think that everything we touch is defiled. So why would you ask a drink from me? The Samaritans were syncretists. They were those who were half-breeds. They were part of the ten tribes, but then they had been during the exile, been intermixed with pagans. And in the process, they became syncretists in their worship. They rejected most of the Old Testament. They only held on to the first five books. Instead of going to the temple in Jerusalem, they had made their own temple on Mount Gerizim. And they said, we can worship God fine in this way. Jesus crosses the Samaritan boundary. He crosses the female boundary. Uh, You notice that when the disciples come back, They're debating in their minds, why is he talking to a woman? They're they're scared to voice it. 
But this is not what a, a rabbi would do in this culture. Both of these are huge cultural walls in that they don't hold Jesus back because he's hungry to do the Father's work. He strikes up conversation with her. He asks for a drink. And by doing so, he draws her into this deeper conversation about living water. Look at the master at work. Look at him taking objects of everyday life to say, let's think a little bit more seriously about your heart, your soul. She's curious. She wants what he has, but that's about it. And that's all it will ever remain at, just wanting maybe some physical blessings until a sinner gets a sense of their sin. And that's why Jesus is eager to go there to, to highlight her sin. He goes there carefully and gently, but he goes there. You see that in verse 16. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. One commentator writes, this is not designed to be merely self-revealing. I mean, in that moment, how she would have shrunk back. Husband? It's not merely designed to be self-revealing. Rather, it is designed to help the woman come to terms with the nature of the gift he's offering. That's why the Lord convicts us of sin. So we start thinking about what does it mean that he's a savior? What is the nature of the gift that he's offering? It's deeper because our need is deeper and, and we need to see that. And so she tries to deflect. She says, well, I don't actually have a husband. She's trying to guard her heart. Sinners don't like to be probed. We don't like to be probed. We like to deflect. We're good at this. But Jesus wants her heart. And so he goes after her heart and he dismantles her defenses and he says, you're right, you don't have a husband, you've had five and now you're living with a man. And that's when this conversation gets very real for the woman. Put yourself in her shoes. Imagine you met a stranger. You've talked to him for five minutes maybe. You've kind of been skeptical about him. What's this living water stuff he's talking about? But you're willing to engage. And after five minutes of conversation, he looks you in the eye and tells you about sins that you have committed maybe 10, five, two years in the past and what sins you're committing right now. You're right. You don't have a husband. You've had five Christian, maybe you've had that experience. What do you mean? Well, you're sitting in church, and it's like the Lord actually knows your heart and your sin as he speaks to you, because he does. And he points it out wisely, gently, but clearly to show us our need in order to show us the nature of the gift he gives. And on hearing this, the woman's ears perk up. She looks back and says, sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Now, prophets are those who speak truth, and she's acknowledging you just spoke truth about me. But it's even more than that, because the Samaritans, as I said, they only held to the first five books of the Bible, and it's in Deuteronomy chapter 18 that you get this clear reference to a Messiah that's to come, and he's going to be the greater prophet than Moses. And for the Samaritans, they were hoping in a Messiah, and it was principally that one, the greater prophet, who's going to come. And so when she says this, it's deeper than just, you're speaking truth about me. Now she's open to the possibility that this man standing in front of her just might be the fulfillment of Deuteronomy 18.
So you see that in verse 25, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. I know Deuteronomy 18. I know what Moses said, the greater prophet's coming, who's called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Again, that's the prophet's work. He will tell us all things. And then we get the verse, verse 26, where the woman's jaw drops along with her water bucket. Verse 26, Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And oh, what a glorious moment this is. What a revelation. Now Jesus reveals it plainly to her. Woman, even though in all your confusion as a Samaritan, as a syncretist, you were chopping out scriptures, and yet you still held on to Deuteronomy 18, and here I am coming to you on your terms in, in order to say, I am he the one you're looking forward to, the one you're waiting for, the one who will speak to you the truth about yourself, but also about the salvation that's found in God. And beloved, it's at that point that the disciples come back and they're wondering what's going on. Jesus is talking to a woman. What possibly could be happening in his life right now that he would resort to something like that, speaking to a woman. And yet Jesus in our text is here to say, disciples, this is not something strange that I'm doing. This is not out of the ordinary. This is my bread and butter. This is my food. I love to meet sinners where they are to bring them living Waters. Congregation, why are we slow in sharing the gospel? It's a question I've been asking myself this week. One huge answer is we have a grossly disordered view of God's heart for evangelism or missions. We think God's reluctant. We think evangelism or missions is a side priority for God. And so it doesn't get on our priority list. And yet here is Jesus, the Son of God, the perfect revelation of the Father, and he's saying, more basic to me than food is seeing sinners saved. And the Holy Spirit uses the Lord's Supper to make us hunger more for the Lord's food, to make Christ's priorities more our priority. That's what the Spirit is saying. Be strengthened, believer, and know what I'm strengthening you for. For having priorities like this Christ. Christ. Maybe it's in your family. As a mother or father, you're giving yourself, and that's, it seems to take up all your time. And how can, I, how can I think about the world out there? And my mind is just so consumed with right here. Well, that is your primary calling. But Jesus is saying, come. And in the weariness maybe that you find of, of lovingly, teaching your children about him, lovingly disciplining your children for their good. In the weariness of it, come and have my priorities so that in the struggle, more and more you can say, yes, Jesus, this is my food too. I want my children or grandchildren to know God. And though it's tiring work, and though I feel like I haven't had a rest and I haven't even stopped for a meal, this is what I hunger for in my home. And then thinking more and more, how can I live consistent with my confession that I can bring this dying world into the blessings that I've received from Christ? And so that means as As naturally as possible, using your daily routines that are already in place, going with the mindset of Jesus through your ordinary routines. 
Maybe it's to a place called Starbucks. That's been my reflection this week. As I go there to write my sermons, am I going, yes, I I need to write sermons for, for the flock here. That's my primary calling. But am I going praying, Lord, I'm hungry for for just one conversation today. Maybe it's two minutes where I can show someone of your goodness that they too can taste and see that you are good. Lord, bring someone to ask a question. May they ask me what I'm writing about. And let me be able to say a sermon. Can I share it with you? Maybe for you it's the hairdresser. Maybe it's your hockey teammate or the neighbor. But there's people there. The Lord's placed them there. And if we think we need to go out of our way to find them, then we probably won't. But the Spirit's saying, open your eyes to those who are there. Start praying, yes, but then be strengthened to take the next step. And maybe like Jesus, follow your master. Maybe like Jesus, it starts with questions. It starts with ordinary conversation. I need a drink. Can I have one, please? Enter their worlds, but go with the mindset of, Father, please, I hunger that this image bearer too would know you. That's Christ's priority that the Spirit is seeking to cultivate in us. And then secondly, and finally, the purpose. The purpose. And I think we need to see this as well. Because what is God's great purpose with our evangelism that looks so ordinary and weak, or with our support of missions, where we maybe raise some money, or we try to encourage those on the mission field, or maybe we wrestle with a call ourselves. How, how can I be supporting this more? And, and yet, we need to ask ourselves, what is God's great goal with these things? Because maybe you've been in a situation at work where you're doing the menial tasks, and you find yourself not really understanding the bigger purpose. And it leaves you frustrated. Why do we do this? And you start to lose steam because you don't see how that task fits into the broader picture. And we often do the same thing when it comes to our evangelism or our support for missions. We lose steam because we don't understand the bigger picture. Why do you or should you seek to share Christ with your unbelieving neighbor or coworker? Why do you or should you give money or yourself to ministry locally or abroad? That's the question we're asking. And there's a number of good answers to that. Uh, One is, I want to love my neighbor well. Every person put on my path is my neighbor, and so I want to respect them as an image bearer, and so I want to help them, you know, by alleviating their physical, emotional, financial suffering. I want to help them, and so I am involved in in maybe some local ministries or foreign ministries to, to do them some physical good. And that's a good answer. Or maybe you say, well, I care about those forms of suffering, but I especially care about eternal suffering. And so I share the gospel with, with them and because I want to save them from an eternal hell. Of course, that's a good reason. That's a great reason for sharing the gospel. It truly is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. But neither of those reasons, as good and as necessary as they are, we need both of those, loving neighbor, want to alleviate their physical suffering, but also then loving the neighbor and wanting to alleviate their eternal suffering. Both of those are good, necessary answers, but neither of them bring us to the ultimate purpose for evangelism or worldwide missions. To see that, we need to listen to how Jesus answers these questions. He's the one who's hungry to do the Father's will. He's the eager evangelist seeking out the Samaritan woman. And we're asking, well, what gave Jesus focus for his mission? And what gave him fuel for his work? And the answer is he knew the Father's great purpose behind it all. 
And you see it in verse 23. The hour is coming and now is. And Jesus is saying, this hour, it's breaking in through me and my work and me heading to the cross. It's breaking in right now. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. And so do you see it? Jesus tells us what the Father is hunting for. You notice that the Father is seeking something. And what is his great aim and his purpose? He's seeking worshipers. And that truth is the great North Star that kept Christ on task. It gave him focus. And here's how it works for us. Because we step back into real life and we see all these crazy headlines in the news. We experience turmoil in our lives living in this broken world. It can all seem so meaningless and chaotic. And maybe you start to wonder, is there anyone steering this great cosmic ship? Is there a purpose behind it all? And Christian, we can get there as we live in that fog. We then start to lose focus. And maybe we give ourselves a little to evangelism or missions. But it's an extra. And if we're honest, it seems like an extra burden. And so we expect little. And we don't know why we do what we do. And so Jesus is here to restore our focus. He says, let me tell you about the Father. In the mess of this world, the Father is seeking not merely to save sinners, but he's seeking to make those sinners into worshipers. The Father is active. In Christ's day and in today, the Father is pursuing that great goal. Sinners who right now are enslaved to worshiping idols... He is seeking them to forgive them, to transform them into true worshipers of himself. And the question for us, Christian, is do you believe it? It's hard to believe. And so, dear believer, when you find it hard to believe, go look in the mirror. Because there you see living proof that the Father is still pursuing his goal. 2,000 years after Christ said these words to the Samaritan woman, the Father sought me. Because he's active in this world to rescue idol worshipers. And as you look in the mirror, you gain some clarity as to how passionate the Father is in his pursuit. Because... Maybe you hear Jesus' words, the Father is seeking true worshipers, and you say, that's nice, I hope he finds some. And yet, dear believer, if you remember your story, that you know that's not how it went. It's not like you were faithfully worshiping God, saying, God, I'm over here worshiping you as you deserve. You can come find me now. Our story is very different. First, we were not seeking after God. We were satisfied to carry on in our own idolatry. And second, even if we were to seek God, we couldn't draw near to the holy God in our unholiness. And so what did the Father do for us? He gave his people everything that they need to make them true worshipers. He gave his Son, first of all, through whom we could draw near to him. Notice verse 24. God is spirit, those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And this word truth, it's often misunderstood as if Jesus is talking about true and false worship. But that's not his point. He's talking about shadow versus reality. In the Old Testament, God gave us these shadows of the high priest and the lamb. But Aaron or the lamb couldn't bring us back to God. We needed the truth. The true substance that stands behind those types. And notice the Father is so eager to seek worshipers like yourself that he gave the truth, Christ. So that we could draw near to the Father in and through the Son. And yet that wasn't enough. 
Our Father is so passionate about this pursuit that he knows our hearts are naturally dead and stubborn, and so he also gave his spirit. The Holy Spirit who causes dead sinners like religious Nicodemus, John 3, or immoral Samaritan women, John 4, or like you and I, dear Christian, the Holy Spirit who causes dead sinners like us to be brought to spiritual life, to set our hearts free from idols, and to show us Christ through the word so that we would draw near through him. Do you doubt if the Father is actively pursuing sinners today? Oh, Christian, look in the mirror and see who sat at this table to worship your Christ because the Father sought you. Being aware of this was Christ's foundation for his mission. The Father will seek and find worshipers. And so I'm committed to going to the cross to be the truth through whom sinners can draw near to the Father. And then Christ passes on his mission to his people. But note this, it's not, first of all, our mission. It's his I will build my church, and now you, my body, go. Go, therefore, and make disciples followers of me. And so we need to see the Father's purpose of worldwide worshipers drawing near to him in and through his Son, by his Spirit, as that foundation on which all our efforts stand. Let me close with this quote from John Piper in his helpful book, Let the Nations Be Glad. He writes this. Missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Missions exist because worship doesn't. Worship is ultimate, not missions, because God is ultimate, not man. When this age is over and the countless millions of the redeemed fall on their faces before the throne of God, missions will be no more. It is a temporary necessity, but worship abides forever. And so doesn't that give you focus as you go to share the gospel? Here is a fellow image bearer that right now should be worshiping the Father, and they're not. And I can tell them about the triune God who will give them everything to make them worshipers too. And so like the Samaritan woman who then was liberated from her shame, she went to the village. She had no natural capacities for this. She goes to the village and look at what she says to them. Come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. That's our message. Come see a man who told me I'm a sinner. And come see him. Could he be the Christ? The Savior. And they say, yes, he's the Savior of the world. And they were right. Amen. Let's sing in a response. Psalter 51.